Hello folks, Brother Arnold again. Uh, appreciate you just kind of listening to me. I've got a bunch of stuff I'd like to say to you and share with you and try to help you. I'm going to read a scripture over here in Psalm 66. It says, uh, For thou, God, hast proved us, and thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou brought us into a net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to roll over our heads. Watch this. We went through fire and through the water, but thou brought us out into a wealthy place. So I want to talk just for a few minutes, just some thoughts here to help you. Uh, when, when circumstances get lousy like they are now with this virus thing, or situations happen in your life, or a divorce, or a lost child, or something, you only have two options. You either become critical, or you become better at praising and singing and worship God. And my only concern is, because I've talked to a number of people across the movement, is that if we're not careful, you turn into an apostolic atheist. I'm talking to people who are supposed to have the Holy Ghost, and they're acting like God fell off the throne, somebody stole the scepter, and hell's in charge. Hell's not in charge of nothing. No place, no time, nowhere. He's not in charge of that. But we have to make a choice. Are we going to respond properly? For this reason, if we begin to criticize and gripe and and do that stupid do that stupid stuff like asking you questions how come this happened to me why did God let this happen to me I always respond to that well why do you expect God to let good stuff happen to you who are you what makes you think that you're supposed to get good stuff and you're supposed to enjoy health and strength it doesn't make any sense listen to me God took Israel from bondage, from the furnace of affliction, brought them through the wilderness to the wealthy place. So first, the wealthy place is not the issue. The path to the wealthy place is the issue. Because the, the wealthy place is simply, what I said last week, the place that God had in mind when he started working with you or me or anybody to get us to that place. But because he's all wise and all knowing and all powerful, he knows the path that we need to take because he knows what's in us. We don't know what's in us. Have you ever thinking how great the prophet Elijah was? Yet God stuck him in that widow's house to sit there and learn how to be domestic with people in poverty when he was robust and wanted to get out on Mount Carmel. But Carmel required Zarephath. It just required it. And sometimes God in his, well, maybe all the time in God's wisdom, he turns around and puts us into situations that we don't like, but it's the path to the wealthy place. I, I, I want to quote a few scriptures here for you, and, and you can look them up later, okay? Job 36, 29. Can any man understand the spreading of the clouds? Because we've got cloud cover everywhere spiritually, emotionally, financially, we're in cloud cover. But can anybody understand? And it says, for the God who is all wise and all knowing, whose paths are perfect, yet he spreads the clouds. Once he spreads the clouds, you got to walk in darkness. You can't walk in light because he puts a cloud. The other scripture says here, I, I, I wrote it down before he says, and he says, do you know, 37, he says, do you know the balancing of the clouds? Do you understand that God balances the clouds and he makes it rain? He makes this happen and all of a sudden he'll choose in your life and say, no, I'm going to block out the sunshine. I'm going to block out the light and you're going to have to learn to walk in darkness. Why? Because in darkness, that's where you find out how valuable your faith is. I like to make a, a strong statement without anybody getting mad. A faith that cannot be tested should never be trusted. No time, no place, nowhere. And if God has put us into a dark situation, he's trying to develop us. Don't ever believe what hell says. Oh, you're going to be destroyed by this. No, no. Bad situations are not designed by God to destroy us, but for us to make discovery and for us to develop because circumstances are simply catalysts that develop character. Because God is more interested in godly character 
than he is in charisma or the ability to preach or sing or whatever that stuff is. That that's not the way it works. So in this situation when he says, and he led us to a wealthy place, oh guess what the process was? He brought us through the fire and you brought us through the water. Isn't that funny? That's life. Opposites. See, fire ascends, rain falls. And we gotta go through both of them. Because those are the things that make life. That's why, you know, you can't have harvest just because you got April, May, June. You also have to have December and November and October because you got to have rain and you got to have sunshine. You have cold, you got good weather. It all makes the cycle for the harvest. Well, I really think that God in his wisdom is allowing this craziness to take place for something beyond I don't understand because there's a harvest coming up. We are heading towards the wealthy place. And the wealthy place is mind-boggling. Just remember, the wealthy place is the place God had in mind when he first asked us to walk with him. That's what the wealthy place is. And it involves a lot of different things. I, I, I want to make a couple of statements here because I'm, you know, I'm just, I guess I get the preacher's itch or something. You only advance by adversity. Only. You only get strength from struggle. Circumstances are the things that God uses to develop us. Resistance is what produces strength and power. When I was younger and healthier and more muscular, I pumped a lot of iron when I was in the Air Force and as a young kid. And the more it resisted, the stronger you built muscles. Because when you pump iron, you literally break stuff down and then it creates new muscle and makes you stronger. So when God puts you in something that's resisting you, it's not to ruin you, it's to help you develop strength and character and the divine nature of God. Watch this, this is so powerful. This Because we're in dark times right now, yet the scripture says, He knoweth what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. The light doesn't dwell with us. He's the author of light. He's the master of light. But he said, just to let you know, you may be in dark things right now, but he knows what's in the darkness. Then you go over to that wonderful book of Job. I love this statement in Job. He says, and God setteth an end to the darkness. Mm. Don't ever believe that hell's in charge of light and hell's in charge of darkness. They ain't in charge of nothing. Remember the Lord, when he rose from the dead, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. That means Satan ain't got the keys to his own house. So Lord, don't let him blow smoke and turn around and say, he's going to make this. No, when God gets ready to end the darkness, pow, he can end it in five seconds. He ended the darkness. But there is the most powerful scripture in the book of Exodus 20, verses 18 through 21. You can look it up later. Here's what it says. And the Lord came down on the mountain, and Sinai shook with a great thundering, and there was lightning, and there was thunder. And the people became terrified. And the Bible says they removed themselves from the mountain. Watch this. It looks just like us Pentecostals. And turned to their preacher and said, hey, you go deal with that. Uh, we'd rather have something secondhand from God than have something firsthand because we're afraid he's going to kill us. Watch this scripture. This is so powerful. You preachers can preach the fire on this. It says, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. So I don't care how thick your darkness is, God is in your thick darkness, and he knows what to do, and he knows how to help you. You know, sometimes when the Lord allows situations in our lives, we get a question mark for a brain. But remember this, Job said, I have kept his way. I have esteemed his way better than my natural food. I have not varied, no. But he says, but he is of one mind, and who can turn him? For the thing which he has appointed unto me, that will he do, and many such things are with him. So if you could accept this from this old guy today, your incident is not an accident. It's an appointment. God has appointed that situation. Why? He's going to help you discover how small, how 
little, how spiritual, whatever you are. And you're also going to experience a revelation of how great he is. Because it wasn't until Joel went through all that stuff that he turned around and said, I put my hand on my mouth. Man, I, I talked about stuff I didn't understand. You're so great and so majestic. I repent. That was the end of the Lord. I told you that last week. God wants to bring us to the place where we see how great he is and how insignificant we are in ourselves. Now we have value and preciousness and worth in the sight of God, but in ourselves, we're nothing. We can't come in, we can't go out. Well, John, as a reward for his love and his commitment to Jesus Christ, gets sentenced to an isolation camp and he gets put on Patmos. Now you would think God is being so cruel and so unkind, but you must understand, to God's way of thinking, Patmos was the wealthy place because he sent him to Patmos, isolated from all distractions. Okay, yeah, he dealt with loneliness. He had to listen to the sea coming in and call him a fool. This is what the Lord did for you because you served him. But while on Patmos, he ended up giving us 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, which we would never have had not God chosen the pathway to the wealthy place. Because that's what God loves to do. He just, he wants to do that all the time. Well, I, I, I hope I'm not losing you on some of this stuff here. It's, it's I, I, I'm, I'm not afraid. I, I don't have all the answers. I'm not filled with fear. All, all I want to say this as kindly as I can. You may question God. You may criticize why God's let this happen. How come this has happened to me? Please. That dishonors God's wisdom. It dishonors God's plan. It makes you somehow smarter than he is. He said, no, I've got to do that. Remember, he was taking Joseph to be the prime minister, but it required the brethren's hate, required the pit, required the trip to, to Egypt, required the, the attack of old lady Potiphar, required two years being forgotten in prison. That was okay. That was the, that was the pathway to the wealthy place. If you remember this, with a scripture I read, you brought us into this, but he says, but then you brought us out of the fire and out of the water into the wealthy place. If God thinks enough of you to bring you into something, don't let any lying devil tell you he can't bring you back out of that thing. Remember, in order for you to get in to you got to go through. That's the way it works. The process and the pathway is what gets you to that place. I, I have a scripture I wanted to share with you guys, and I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just, John 18, 10 and 11. Jesus is talking about getting crucified, and, and Peter flips out on him. Fine. But watch what he says. The cup which my Father giveth me, shall I not drink it? Here's what I'm concerned about. We Pentecostals, God is handing us a cup. It may be a cup of trembling, maybe a cup of insecurity, maybe a cup of apprehension. But if God has handed you the cup, don't insult them by throwing the cup away and saying, I'll become my own savior. I don't have any idea why a lot of this stuff is happening. But he said, look, I'm going to drink this cup. Oh, and by the way, if you read Hebrews chapter 5, it's the only place I can find recorded in the scripture where Jesus was ever afraid. It says that he said, it spoke that he feared. What did he fear? He didn't fear devils. He didn't fear disease. He didn't fear demons. He didn't fear people, politicians. No, he feared what was in the cup. What was in the cup was villainy and sickness and dirtiness and ire idolatry and ungodliness and he was going to be forced to drink that because when he drank that then he became sin for mankind said he feared but nevertheless he learned obedience through the things which he suffered well if jesus christ had to go through a learning process in obedience to the things he suffered why do we pentecostals think that i believe in jesus i believe in jesus that, that, what are you talking about that, that's crazy. You know, I preach that sermon all the time. Can God trust you with trouble? Can God trust you with trouble? What's all the complaining and the griping about? You're either going to pout 
or you're going to praise. You're either going to pout or you're going to pray. You're either going to get frustrated or you're going to trust God. Said, like Job said, he knows the way I take. I can't find him. He's hiding himself. And, 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 and one scripture says, O oh Lord, thou art a God that hideth thyself. Say what you want to. I, I, I'm not happy when God hides himself. Nevertheless, I have to walk in faith. That's why Paul said in Acts 17, when he was talking to those people at Mars Hill, said, we happily feel after him if we could find him. He's literally saying there's times when your spiritual highway gets very dark and you have to literally grope by grace. You have to grope by grace until you can find him. But he said, though he be not very far from any one of us. And it's just like, sometimes we just, we don't understand. We are not second-rate believers because we don't understand. I don't have all the answers. You know, when the Lord showed up to Job, if you read the book of Job, 42 chapters, there were hundreds of questions. God never answered one. God asked Job more questions than Job asked God. And so when you get complaining and finding fault and griping, God can ask you some questions. <laughs> I remember years ago preaching a sermon about the woman of Samaria who came to Jacob's well. And you can say what you want to, but when God gets ready, he can ask you a question and embarrass the fire out of you. Uh, where's your husband? What, what, what did you do? Did, did, what were you doing at that movie theater? How come you were in that hockey top? He, he can, how's your tithing record doing? How's your giving? He can ask you some stuff that'll make you shut your mouth and just go, well, okay. So when I, when I look at this stuff, it's so mind-boggling to me. That this thing about uh, this other scripture in Luke 24, 26. I'll, I'll finish in just a minute. When they were walking along Emmaus Road and they were telling him of the things that had happened. Art thou a stranger? Don't you know what happened? A man, Jesus, Nazareth, the mighty prophet in word and deed, and the people killed him, and now the folks have said he's resurrected. And you know how those crazy women are. They, they get all emotional. They don't know. They're talking about speaking to angels and stuff. And and I like the way the Lord is so, you know, can, can win friends and influence people. Oh, fools! <laughs> And slow of heart to believe all the things that are written in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And beginning at that time, he began to explain to him. Now, now, Brother Tony, you talk about a great statement. That was the day when the Word explained the Word. <laughs> and, he turned around, and he turns around and makes this wonderful statement. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things that he might enter into his glory? Now, my limited understanding, apparently there is a dimension and a position of glory you and I can't get to without suffering. There is a dimension in God we cannot reach without having to go through that pathway that takes us to the wealthy place. Now, if you just accept me just another minute, nobody can go back in their past and I know we said we're going to start over. No, you can't go back and start, and start over. What you do is you start from where you are and you change your future. You can't change your past. That's impossible to change your past. I, I read an interesting scripture that I've never heard preached, and I'm sure it's been preached, but it's what right here in Psalm 65 Listen to this. He said, Thou water, in 10 and 11, Thou waterest the ridges thereof, you settest furrows thereof, Thou makest it soft with showers, Thou blessest and, and bring springs to it, Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy path drops fatness. Here it is. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness. You mean you can find pasture in your wilderness? You can find substance in your wilderness? You can find strength and renewal in your wilderness. Now remember, when you get in the wilderness, they don't have a little squared off thing with a rope said, here's your pasture. You have to search for it. You have to stretch for it. You have to. But he said, there are pastures in the wilderness. Well, some of us are in the wilderness right now, but it's okay. God is going to take us through this stuff. Amen. I, I want to say one more thing and I'll finish, okay? I know I've been a long time here, but... 
but listen carefully. I read this years ago when I was a young guy. Every great story has always been written with the author's blood. Now watch. This is so powerful. Homer, the great poet and lyric writer, was blind. Helen Keller was deaf, blind, and dumb. Lincoln lost more efforts at election than anybody had in history, yet became the greatest president of the United States, okay? Because they don't give up. One of my friends or my favorite heroes when I was a boy growing up was the great Rocky Marciano, the undefeated world boxing champion, who was too short and whose reach was too short. And yet every time he went to fight, he got his brains beat out. And that last time when I got this story bump, he was like to the 14th round. His eye was closed. His nose was broken. His mouth was bleeding. And the referee came over and said, Rocky, uh, man, you're in bad shape. We need, to, we need to stop this fight. And looking through a closed eye and a broken nose and bleeding mouth, he said, give me just another minute. I know I can fight one more round. And he gets up on the 15th round and he knocked the guy out and he became the world champion. So what I'm asking you right now, with all your darkness and all your pain and all your misunderstanding, tell yourself, by the grace of God, I can fight one more round. I can get through this thing. That's why Micah said, rejoice not against me, O my enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. Watch. And when I sit in the darkness, oh, and he knows what's in the darkness, and he sets an end to the darkness, and he welcomes us into the thick darkness where he is, I'm coming out of this. you got to tell yourself, by the grace and mercy of God, I am coming out of this. Last point, and I'm going home. The only fish that you'll ever find that goes with the current is a dead one. Every other fish swims against the current. That's how the salmon gets his strength. That's how these fish. I pray God will bless you and God will help you and that these few words would encourage you. I don't have all the answers, but I know the one that is the answer. God bless. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.